an armored car filled to the brim with cash. A classic example of a brilliant inside job. The perfect heist. But there's no honor among thieves. It feels like a kick right in the stomach. It just jumped out. Well, both of us looked at it and went, uh-oh. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. job application for some armored car companies, prospective employees are asked, have you ever thought about robbing an armored car? If they answer no, they don't get the job. Everyone has had a dream about pulling off the perfect heist. Meet the three Ps. Angelo Portante, an armored car company employee for eight years. Piero Persibali, a veteran officer with the Toronto Police Force, and Andre Pelliconi a part-time chef and former bouncer. Angelo Portante and Piero Persibali were ideal as the two masterminds. Angelo knew the inside workings of the armored car company and Piero knew the inside procedure of the cops. Armored car security today is so tight that most thieves wouldn't waste their time trying to rob one. But no matter what protection these armored car companies install, there is a factor they can't control, the human factor. Angelo had a hunch that one of his fellow employees, an armored car guard who is also an auxiliary cop, would likely depart from procedure to help a fellow cop in trouble. Angelo's old friend Andre was going to play that cop. Are you starting to get the idea? On the morning of the heist, Angelo Portante calls officer Piero Persibali, saying everything is set for that night. Angelo then contacts two other accomplices, both truck drivers, to stand by for further instructions. Piero will control the whole operation from a distance. He knows that if it's going to work, everything would have to go off like clockwork. The conspirators meet before going into action. Meanwhile, Angelo, the inside man, has cleverly placed himself far from the scene of the crime, in a completely different part of town, a perfect alibi. It's the last weekend of the summer, the Labor Day weekend, and the targeted armored car is stuffed full of cash. To distract police, Piero gets the two truck driver accomplices to place phony 911 calls, saying that there is a brawl in progress and that a cop is in trouble. It works. Every police car in the district rushes in the opposite direction. When the armored car arrives at its scheduled stop, Andre, the fake cop, goes into action. Andre drives the armored car to a parking lot. The money is unloaded into a waiting van. The van is then driven to a meeting place where Piero steps in and takes over. He drives off in the van alone.
At the end of Angelo's shift, he meets up with Piero. They're like two kids in a candy store. They've actually pulled it off. The armored car had been carrying over three million dollars in cash. Gone. Minutes after the heist, police are called and arrive on the scene. Shortly after that, the armored car is found half a mile away, empty. Investigators immediately question the driver, since he is the only one who saw what happened. He says, there was a cop who seemed to be in some kind of trouble and needed help. But when I opened my door, he pulled a gun on me and drove off with the truck. The armored car crew are all taken back to police headquarters to be questioned. All the police know is $3 million is missing. The investigators assigned to the case are Doug Kwan and Rod Redquist. In an investigation like this, the first thing you want to do is clear the people who are working on the truck because they are the most likely suspects right off the bat. Investigators interview all three of the armored car crew. But to the police, the driver is the most suspicious. He was very calm, cool, and uh, Doug and I both found that very unusual given that set of circumstances. He certainly was a strong suspect because of the fact that on that evening he wasn't supposed to drive. Um, he asked the other fella who, uh, who was the guard if he would mind letting him drive for the evening. Not only this, the driver opened his door, breaking a cardinal rule and admitted not wearing his gun, an equally serious breach of company rules. This was starting to feel a lot like an inside job. The ident squad goes over the armored car with a fine-toothed comb. You go in the truck, you don't know what is evidence. Anything could be evidence in that thing. So you have to consider it all, you have to look at it all, you have to, to collect a lot of items. And you take a lot of items and a lot of them are useless at the end of it all. But you don't know that right away. Ed meticulously collects hairs and fibers from the scene. Then he zeroes in on something. When I see papers scatter on the ground, I think, oh good, there could be footprints on these papers. I may be able to collect them. So the way I do it, and in this particular case, I've got a, a kit that I carry with me. He places a sheet of mylar over the paper and zaps it with his electrostatic charger. And that gives it a static charge, and the mylar goes down into the paper, and the paper gets sucked up into the mylar, and the dust attaches to the mylar. So when you peel the mylar off the paper, you get the dust impression going with the mylar. You flip her over and you get the oblique lighting, you look at it, and if you see the footprint, all right. It's a, it gives you a chill when you see that footprint. You go, oh, you, I gotcha, I gotcha. As exciting as it may be for the ident officer, he still needs a suspect's shoe to make a match. Police also suspect that the bogus 911 calls are connected to the heist. They were recorded on tape, but for the recordings to be useful as evidence, police need suspects and voices for comparison. They said there were police officers. Somebody call 911. Okay, where? Investigators were stumped. They had an armored car driver they suspected, a shoe print that wasn't leading to the bad guys, and two phony 911 calls. It looked like the three Ps were going to get away with it. The pressure is on. The case makes headlines every day for a week, and the police still don't have a serious lead. A week after the heist, Angelo and Piero are sitting on the cash. But Angelo is starting to get cocky, flashing money around and talking just a bit too much. A $50,000 reward is offered for information leading to the arrest of the robbers. A man calls in with a tip. He suggests they check out someone the cops had more or less ruled out. Angelo Portante. They start to dig into Angelo's background. They learn that in addition to working as a guard for the company, Angelo also has his own private security agency on the side. 
Well, sure, we got information that he was a friendly type of guy, a likable guy. He, uh, he was open, pretty courteous and cordial with everybody. He was a former auxiliary police officer. To investigators, Portante seems a long shot as a suspect. And besides, they know he was working far away from the scene at the time of the heist. They go back to the informant for more details. He described the bundles of money, which were we did not make public. Um, they, they had certain uh, wrappers on them. and Identifiable markings yeah, on them. Only the person that had done the robbery or, or had spoken to someone would have knowledge of it. It is enough for police to set up a sting. They want to surprise Angelo away from his home so he can't alert anyone or make a phone call and possibly move the money. We called them up and uh, had a conversation with them, told them that uh, you know, we were in a, our own business and we wanted to uh, arrange a contract where he'd be moving some product for us. And uh, he was pretty excited that uh, he may have a client here and he agreed to meet us. And uh, when we got there, he expected to meet a couple businessmen. Angelo was caught off guard. He's got 14,000 bucks on him. He just kind of went pale, and I think he knew the gig was up. Police obtain a search warrant for Angelo's office and for his home. There they find some valuables that he couldn't possibly have afforded on his salary. We found approximately $170,000 worth of diamonds in a safe with an illegal weapon. And it just started to look worse and worse for him at that point. In Angelo's office, police find detailed cell phone bills. His telephone call display is especially intriguing. It lists the phone numbers of people Angelo called on the day of the robbery. It's a real windfall for the investigators. The fact that he had these phone numbers still on his call display from the day of the robbery and the day before, I, mean, I never expected to find that. So police begin checking Angelo's call list. Many of the numbers are traced to cellular phones. Every time you make a call on a cell phone, the date, time, and location are registered digitally. And this information is stored in a central data bank. This technology has led to a whole new branch of forensics, tracking the source of cell phone calls used in crimes. Warren Leonard is a Bell Mobility fraud and security expert. He works with law enforcement on criminal matters involving cell phones. We deal with the police uh, when they come in for uh, informational requests. Uh, we satisfy search warrants, uh, subpoenas. We do the court testimony on call records if required. Leonard provides the police with the names of the individuals whose cell phone numbers appear on Angelo's call display. Two of the numbers are traced to the truck drivers. At least 20 calls had gone back and forth between these truck drivers and Angelo on the day of the robbery. But there are still several names which they get from Angelo's call display that investigators can't account for. One of them is none other than Persibali. They have no idea who he is, but two weeks after the robbery, while going through their own internal police directory, they get a lucky break. While looking through the nominal roll, totally nothing to do with this case, looking for an officer's name who started with a P that we were going to send a, uh, a notification to go to court for. Um, there was Percivali's name, and it just jumped out. And, wow. So we said, look at Percivali. Both of us looked at it and went, uh-oh. It feels like you've had a kick right in the stomach, you know, to, to be crude about it. Um, to think that a police officer, one of our own brothers, would be involved in a, in a serious uh, offense like this with the potential of so much violence and, uh, and greed. But the driver's account described a very different looking cop at the heist. Police are determined to find out Persibali's connection to the crime. In order to set him up, police decide to do something rarely done before. They place a wire in Piero's car. They bug a police car. Police hope that Piero will lead them to the others involved in the robbery, and quite possibly to the missing millions. While Angelo sits in jail, detectives continue to investigate his cell phone activity around the time of the heist. Angelo might not have been anywhere near the scene of the crime, but his cell phone activities may turn his alibis into Swiss cheese. He is the custodian on that route, so he is by himself in the back of the truck. 
and it's a reinforced steel truck, so you can have your own private conversations in the back of that truck. Angelo's calls that night were not quite as private as he had hoped. His cell phone was also doing some talking to the database on the cellular network. We create a, a call record for every call that's made on the network. These individual call records have a, a variety of information stored in them, such as your mobile number, so we know who to build a call to, the numbers that were dialed, the duration of the call, and the location where your call was made or received in terms of our towers. This is a, an example of a tower map. Here we have the red dot indicating the location of the tower. The outside area shows the diameter of the coverage area for the tower. And then you can see the individual pieces of the pie we call sectors. Calls can be traced to exact sectors, which can be as small an area as a few city blocks. Using this data, can detectives place these individuals at a certain place at a certain time? And can they relate this information to the execution of the perfect heist? Two months after the heist, police haven't found the money and Angelo is keeping quiet. They lack hard evidence to make further arrests, so they focus in on Persibali in hopes that he'll unwittingly provide a breakthrough. Through the wiretaps on Persibali's car, they overhear him alerting one of the truck drivers that the heat is on. Police nab the truck driver and bring him in for questioning. They suspect that he may have been one of the 911 callers. They ask him to read the identical phrases recorded on the 911 call. The recordings are taken to Steve Pausak at the Center for Forensic Sciences. Pausak compares the 911 voices with the truck drivers through what's called a sound spectrograph. There's a big brawl behind the Kelsey's. There's like 50, 40. There's a big brawl behind the There's a big brawl behind the there's a big brawl behind the Kelsey's. There's a big brawl behind the Kelsey's. So he wants to determine whether the acoustical features of both voices are the same. There's a big brawl behind the Kelsey's. There's like 50, 40. There's a big brawl behind the Kelsey's. So like 50, 40. Pausak concludes that the truck driver's voice is a probable match, but probable isn't enough for investigators. When pressed further, the truck driver finally spills the beans about the heist. Investigators now have a good idea of how the crime worked, but they still need to pinpoint the exact whereabouts of the suspects on the night of the robbery in order to make a convincing court case. The hard evidence they need requires many days of painstaking work. Pouring over data, maps, cell phone records. Finally, the precise connections are made and they are able to construct a plausible picture of exactly what happened and when to the second. 10.48 a.m. on the day of the heist, Angelo calls Piero saying everything is on schedule for that night. 12.33 p.m., Angelo calls one of the truck drivers it's the first of more than 50 calls back and forth between Angelo, Piero, and the two truck drivers that day. 4 p.m., the crew is observed leaving to do their rounds. 10 p.m., the conspirators meet before going into action. 11.02, they leave the meeting spot. 11.45, Piero, following the armored vehicle, has the truck drivers make the diversionary calls. Eleven fifty. Piero watches the armored car approach the bank. Eleven fifty-two. The heist itself. It takes less than a minute to pull it off. a.m., 
Angelo is called in the back of his armored car and informed that everything has gone off as planned. After two months and thousands of man hours, detectives can at last move in and make their arrests. But there doesn't turn out to be much honor among thieves. The truck drivers decide to become witnesses for the prosecution against the big three. Angelo Portante, Piero Persibali, and Andre Palacone. The cell phones told the story, and forensics could back that story up. But during the court case, they hit a major stumbling block. The three Ps all refused to acknowledge that they even know one another. The whole case could fall apart unless the prosecution can link them. That's when investigators remember a piece of evidence they had not paid much attention to earlier. After they arrested Piero Persibali, they found a small yellow sticky note in his briefcase. Written on it was the fake cop Andre Pelliconi's name. From looking at Angelo's day timer, police believed it was in Angelo's handwriting. If they can prove it, a clear, unbroken chain can be established connecting the two masterminds to each other and to the fake cop. Fortunately, in this instance, I had a ton of printing. The day planner was just filled with hand printing and numerals all through it, so I had lots of material for comparison. His A is formed the same as all his other A's, goes up to the top, down to the bottom on the right-hand side, cuts diagonally across the left, and continues out the crossbar, forms a connector to the following letter again. It was fortunate that uh, Mr. Portanti is such a distinctive printer or handwriter. All the forms came out beautifully for comparison. The similarities just jumped off the page. I ended up in a situation where I was sure that this was the same writer, and I didn't have any doubts whatsoever. That was the clincher. Angelo Portanti got 10 years. Piero Persibali also got 10 years and Andre Pelliconi, six years. The two truck drivers got off in exchange for their testimony. But what happened to the money? Angelo's brother, Tony, claimed he gave three gun cases filled with cash to a friend, who in turn claimed he gave them to his girlfriend, but they were never found. To date, they've accounted for over a million dollars. That leaves over two million dollars still missing. Maybe it will turn out to be the perfect heist after all. The stories on Exhibit A are based on actual cases. The names of the victims have been changed to protect their identities. The names of the guilty are real.